believe we have some in the back. Psalm 78 is a big one. It is a big psalm. 72 verses. And so your reward is dinner <laughs> when we get there. But Psalm 78 has 72 verses. And I've given you a handout that will help me to uh, stick close to the script. So I don't chase all the many, many, many rabbits that are going to present itself in this text. There's a lot of history in this text. And as a result, there's a lot of things that pop up in my mind as I studied. But we're going to try to stick to the script tonight. But Psalm 78, again, 72 verses. You have 10 blanks there. Uh, in addition to that one, you've got one on the conclusion. Very simple conclusion tonight. But let's look at verse number one of Psalm 78. If you're taking notes, number one, you're going to see the request. Basically, this is a request to listen up. In other words, hey, listen up. Listen, let me get your attention. That's kind of what's going on in verse one. Psalm 78, verse one. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. In other words, listen up. The request, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. We're going to open in a word of prayer. And as we pray this evening, as we dive into Psalm 78, I would encourage you to give your heart, your ear, your mind to the Lord tonight. That is my request. That is the request of Asaph tonight from Psalm 78. And so I'd encourage you to give your all to Almighty God as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Psalm 78. When I first saw it, I was rather intimidated a couple weeks ago, knowing that we're using these psalms on Thursday nights. And yet, as I studied it for the last couple of weeks, I'm excited to present the information and to cover the topic of forgiveness. Our greatest example of forgiveness is found in Psalm 78. So God, I ask you to help us intentionally learn from you tonight from your word in Psalm 78 and a few other passages that we have noted. We love you, Lord. Thank you for prayer meeting tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So point number one, the request. The request to listen up. Point number two tonight, the review in, in verses two and three. The review. There's something new in every review. I learned that from Pastor Scheibach. Dr. Scheibach taught for many years in the Bible college. And before you take a midterm, before you take a final, usually you get an opportunity to do a review. And Pastor Scheibach, I wasn't in his classes, but he would teach his, his students. He also tells us to his church that in, in, there's something new in every review, in every review. Well, what is this review we're talking about in verses 2 and 3? I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of, what is that next word? Dark sayings of old. So he's saying something that's been said before. He's reviewing. Verse 3, which we have heard and known. We've heard this before. We know this. Which we have heard and known and our fathers told us. So we're getting ready to experience a review from Asaph. But remember tonight, there's something new in every review. Please don't let the old, old story get old. Don't let the old, old story get old. If tonight I said, turn your Bibles to John chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 16, that ought to excite you. But sometimes there's believers who go, well, we already know that. And usually the immature ones say that. Because there's not a passage in the word of God that I don't get excited about when a preacher gets up and says, turn to John chapter 3. I'm going, oh, I hope he's addressing the first part of the chapter. I like the second part, but I really like the first part. And most people address the first part. Why am I excited about that? Because there's something new in every review. And here in verses 2 and 3, he says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. Again, he says, I have your attention, verse 1, the request, listen up. I have your attention, but I'm going to tell you something you've already heard before, something you've known your whole life. In fact, our fathers told us about this. 
So he's going through a review. Notice verse 4. Number 3, the reveal. The reveal, verse 4. He's shedding some light on the topic. Verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. So in verse 4, he says, I'm going to reveal this not just to you, but I'm going to reveal it to your children, to the next generation. I'm not going to hold back the goodness of God, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. I'm going to reveal it even though it's the old, old story. I'm going to keep telling this to every generation as long as I can. So we will not hide them, he says in verse 4. We will not hide them. We're going to reveal the truth to this generation and the generations to come. Notice number 4 tonight, verse 5 and 8, 5 through 8. The rehearsing, the rehearsing, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Verse 5, he says... For he established a testimony in Jacob. I thought about preaching a series toward the end of the year in honor of our Louisiana friends called Who Dat? <laughs> but who in the world is Jacob? And literally look at his entire life. I really feel bad personally when I think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I literally should know everything about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because there's nothing else that's going to be added to Abraham's life, to Isaac's life, and to Jacob's life. Why do I not, at this stage of my life, at this age of my life, why do I not know everything about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It's all here. And it's not even that big. It's not that much information. So why don't I know more? Well, here we see the rehearsing, and he says in verse 5, for he established a testimony in Jacob. Right away, we should think some things about Jacob. We should already be rehearsing some things that we already know. Part of the old, old story. And so here the Bible says again in verse 5, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them. Even the children which should be born. Meaning they aren't born yet, but they better know this. And these are what, what was mentioned before even Asaph's birth. And now he's talking about the next generation. And he's the generation in verse 6. The children which should be born, that's him. Who should arise and declare them to their children. That's what he's doing right now. That they might set their hope in God. He's like, our fathers taught our fathers who taught us to set our hope in God. And it is our responsibility to teach our children and our children's children to put their hope, set their hope in God. Verse 7, and not forget the works of God. Let me ask you this. For my children, were you there when I was born? No. So the only way you're going to hear the history, the events surrounding, I just, I, we all went out to dinner and I got to have a one-on-one -on -one dinner with Sadie. And while I was sitting there with Sadie, I was thinking about the events that surrounded her birth. The fact that she was born in L.A. in the driveway of our house. That, that blows my mind that that happened. You have to have 12 kids to have a story like that. And I was thinking about that. But you know, her children will never know the story if I don't tell them and if she doesn't tell them. And if those of us who are older than her children, if we don't tell them, they'll never know how their mom was born and the events around that. And Asaph here is saying, listen, verse 7 that they might set their hope in God. Our children and our children's children won't set their hope in God if we don't encourage them to do so. Verse 7 says, And not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Our children and our children's children will forget the works of God if we don't tell them about Him. They're going to look at this country with disdain. 
They're going to hate America. Our children will hate America if we don't teach our children how good God's been to America. We have to teach that. And here Asaph is saying our children are going to be without hope if we don't teach them to put their hope, set their hope in God. Verse 8, and might not be as their, what is that next word? And might not be as their, okay, so not all the fathers did right. And he's saying we got to teach our children and our children's children so that they're not as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So he says we need to rehearse the things that God has done. It should never bother you when a preacher gets up and says, turn your Bibles to Genesis 1. Oh, we already know he created the heaven and the earth. That should never get old to you. The rehearsing of the word of God should never get old to you. And Asaph says we cannot allow the truth to fall in the street. This is why we're even having a kid's crusade. Why? Because these children need to know that, yes, Jesus loves you. That there is a God. And they won't know if we don't tell them. And so here we see the rehearsing in verses 5 through 8. Verses 9 through 16, we see the rewards. The rewards in verses 9 through 16. Notice verse number 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea. What's the name of that sea? The Red Sea. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he made the waters to stand as an heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud. And all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great de deeps, depths. <laughs> he brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. Now, what he's doing in verses, we're not done, but in verses 9 through 16, he's sitting here reversing, or, 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 uh, um, rehearsing all the rewards and the benefits and the blessings of God. And he gives one illustration of the Red Sea and the water being on heaps and they pass through. And he's saying, yet, notice your Bible. He says in verse 13, he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made them waters to stand as in heap. In the daytime, he led them by the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire, he claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And verse 17, the word of God says, and they sin yet the more. And so even though he went through all of the rewards in verses 9 through 16, they still sin, and we're going to get to that, but I wanted to share this with you. I believe this is in your handout, Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. And so in verses 9 through 16, we see the mighty rewards of Almighty God to his people. But we already began verse 17. Notice the rebellion. And verses 17, 18, and 19, the rebellion. Even though God blessed them daily, loaded them daily with benefits, they still rebelled. And verses 17, 18, and 19. Verse 17. The Bible says the rebellion. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. 
And they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? So you have this rebellion. First Samuel chapter 15, 23, the first part says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. God hates rebellion and God's people who he daily loaded with benefits rebelled against him to the point that they said, God can't even take care of us out here in the wilderness. Can God even furnish a table in the wilderness? The rebellion. Notice number next, the rejection in verses 20 through 33. Verses 20 through 33. I'm trying to go quickly and get to our point this evening. Verses 20 through 33, the rejection. They were rejected by a loving, giving, almighty God. Notice your Bible, verse number 20, all the way down to verse 33. Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore, the, lo the Lord, what are those next two words? The Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed, what is that next word? Because they believed not in God. Now, he's going in order. They already experienced most of the exodus up to this point in, uh, in his rehearsal of the story. They, re they experienced all of it, but in this rehearsal of the story, he's like, God has been so good to them. He daily loaded them with benefits. And yet the Bible says, because verse 22, they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, though... He had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. Corn of cob. Corn on the cob is in heaven. Anyway, and he opened up the window, the door of heaven, and gave them corn of heaven, manna to eat. Verse 25, man did eat angels' food. Wow. He set them meat to the full, all you could eat, to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven. Wouldn't it have been nice for us who live out in Ontario to have a nice wind? Oh, would have been nice. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven. And by his power, he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their habitations. So they did eat and were well filled for he gave them their own desire they were not estranged from their lusts. He took care of their physical wants and needs. Wants, their own lust. They were not estranged from their lusts. But while their meat was yet in their mouths, I need your help. The what of God? The wow. wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen man of Israel. I'm not preaching this tonight, but that's like that second part and smote down the chosen man of Israel. I say these three things all the time. God loves you. God wants to use you. And God has a specific plan for your life, but he's not a dictator. He's not going to force you to do what he really wants you to do as the potter. He wants you to be a vessel of honor, but he's not going to force it on you. And these men, they were just living, eat, drinking, and being merry. And God, while the food was in their mouths, 
the wrath of God came upon them, verse 31, and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen man of Israel. For all this, they, what are those next two words? For all this, they, that's amazing in verse 32. Wow, God just killed all of the, the fattest people in our congregation and the leadership, a lot, they're dead. So what are you doing tomorrow, man? I'm getting drunk. What? In spite of his wrath, they sinned still. Notice your Bible, verse 32. For all this, they sinned still and believe, what is that next word? And believe not for his wondrous works. Therefore, their days did he consume in emptiness, vanity, and their years in trouble. What a wasted life. What a wasted life. So we see the rebellion in verses 17 through 19, but now we see the rejection as a result of their rebellion, the rejection of a loving, giving God toward even his chosen people. Let's continue. Verses 34 and 35, the return, the return. When I first read this, I was excited. I was like, oh, the turning point. Nope. Notice this, the return. Verse 34 and 35. When he slew them, then they sought him. And I was like, yes, finally. So God is, is wrath. He's, he's, he's holy. He's just. He has a righteous uh, path. And he's killing them, his people. And as a result of that, verse number 34, when he slew them, then they saw him. And I thought, sweet, this is good. And they returned and inquired early after God. Yes, this is good. Verse 35. And they remembered that God was their rock. And the high God there, what is that next word? Redeemer. He's our rock. He's our redeemer. What were we doing? All of this death, all of this disease, all of this dysfunction because we've sinned and we've gone a whoring from God. God, I'm returning back. I remember you're our rock. You're our redeemer. This is like the best part of the chapter, I thought. I thought. Yes, they return, verse 34 and 35. I gave you Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. They had no problem returning and confessing. We were wrong. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. But they didn't forsake. They confessed. But they didn't forsake. Let's keep reading. I'll prove it to you. Verses 36 and 37. I call this the rambling. The rambling. The definition of rambling, I've given it to you in your notes. It means to rove, to wander, to walk, ride or sail from place to place without any determinate object in view. They're like vagabonds. Nomads. Where are you going? Just going. Well, where you come from? Over there. Where are you going? Over there. What's your plan? I don't know. Just roaming. Nomads. No direction. They're rambling. They're roving. They're wandering. They're walking. They have no object in view. It also means to visit many places, to rove carelessly or irregularly, as to ramble about the city, to ramble over the country. They're literally just going wherever the wind takes them. Well, notice your Bible, the rambling, verse 36 and 37. Nevertheless, <laughs> let, let, context, look at 34 and 35. When he slew them, they saw him, and they returned and inquired after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God, their redeemer. Good stuff. Nevertheless, they were rambling. They did flatter with their mouth. And they lied 
unto him with their tongue. God, if you don't kill me, I promise I'll give you my life. God, if you spare me, I promise I surrender all. God, if you do this, I promise I'll do that. So God did this, and they were rambling. They were lying. That's what the Word of God says. Look at your Bible again at verse number 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their, what is that next word? For their heart was not right with him. Oh, their outward looked really good. They were all at the altar that day, but their heart, the word of God says, was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. So they said stuff, but their walk didn't match it. So we see the rambling. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17 says, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh God, I shouldn't have done it. God, if you'll just save me, if you'll spare me. And God says, okay. And as soon as you get out of the jam, you're right back where you were. And they lied to Almighty God. They lied right toward Him. So we see the rambling. But lastly, and this is the point of emphasis, and this is a huge portion of the text, verses 38 all the way down to 72. I've entitled this lesson, Our Greatest Example of Forgiveness. At this point, Israel, God's people, Jacob, God's people, these, they've done nothing worthy of the goodness of God. But this we see in verses 38 through 72, our greatest example. I call this the Redeemer. We could have called it the Rock. We could have called it all kind of names. But this is Almighty God. And this is our greatest example of forgiveness. Look at verses 38 through 72. But he, so at this point, God's people, God, if you'll do this, I'll get right with you. God says, okay, extends mercy. They're lying through their teeth. So what does God do? Strike them dead? No, look what God does. But he, that's almighty God, being blank. What is that blank? Being full. full. Of compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them. What is that next word? <laughs> Did they deserve it? Do you deserve it? Then why are you so proud? I mean, who do we think we are? What does God do? But He, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea. Many a time, many a time, turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. He had some of it, but he didn't stir it all up. For he remembered that they were but flesh. Okay, I have to finish this passage. But we have to understand that God loves us. I mean... Before we finish this text, do you realize that Almighty God loves you? Girls, do you realize God loves you? Alden, do you realize God loves you? He loves you. Like, unconditionally, no strings attached. What have they done that has merited the full compassion of God? All they've done is sinned and lied and completely forgotten that He's their Redeemer and Rock. And then they repented without, I mean, kind of sorrowful tears, but they lied. Their heart wasn't even in it. And God still delights in mercy. So notice your Bible. But he, verse 38, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? 
Yea, they turned back and tempted God. And what is that next word? And limited the Holy One of Israel. Are we as a church limiting God with what we could be doing in the city of Bellflower in Los Angeles County? I don't know. But does God sit on his throne saying, I have so much more for solid rock, but they're limiting me. Now, I'm full of compassion, and I delight in mercy, and I'll continue to use them, and I won't go all full wrath on them, but I sure am going to hold back from them because they're limiting me. I can't bless their secret sins. Yeah, they come and sing, oh, I love Jesus, but don't they know I see them on Monday? Don't they know I hear their conversations at work? Don't they know that I see their internet search history? Don't they know I, I hear the gossip? Don't they know I see the slander? Don't they know I'm a holy God who's omnipresent? And yet I'm full of compassion. Many churches are shutting their doors. We're not. Why? Because we're special? No, because God's full of compassion. And he's allowing us to stay open, but I hope we're not limiting him. Hear these people, Asaph said, yea, they turned back and tempted God, even though they knew the goodness of God and he was their rock and redeemer. They still tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered, what is that next word in verse 42? They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sort of flies among them, which devoured them and frogs, which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle. He's going through the history of the goodness of God and the benefits of God that these people forgot about. Verse 47, he destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to, pest, to the pestilence and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of Ham, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so that they feared not. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to his mountain, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them an inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. I can't dissect this like I wish I could. But do you understand what's happening? If you know your Bible, if you know the history of the Exodus, you're thinking of story. If you're like me and the Holy Spirit's talking to you, you're thinking of story after story. I'm thinking of Abraham going, this is where you want me to stop? It looks full. <laughs> There's cities already built. There's Canaanites and parasites and whatever. All these sites, they're all here. It's all full. But this is where you want me to stop? Yeah, yes, okay. And you're going to give me this land. It's already inhabited. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to live at homes I didn't build and, and reap fruit that I didn't plant and harvest. Okay, this is great. I mean, if you know your history, that's what God did. And yet God's people kept turning aside. 
set up high places. What's the purpose of a high place? Ultimately, what's the purpose of a high place? To worship. So if you're setting up a high place, I put that in air quotes, to worship God, have at it. But they didn't set up high places to worship God because God didn't say set up a high place to worship me. He has a tabernacle, a sanctuary, and they rejected that. And they begin to worship idols or continue back and forth, worshiping idols constantly. So if you know your Bible, this history is amazing. If you don't study, study. What verse are we on? Let's say 55. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them an inheritance by line and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. <laughs> I like that. Yet they tempted and provoked the most high God. I don't like that. And kept not his testimonies. I don't like that either. But turned back uh -uh, and dwelt unfaithfully like their fathers. And they were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. Moved Almighty God to jealousy. Jealousy and, and envy are not the same. Jealousy, biblical jealousy, is Almighty God looking at his people and not receiving the love that he deserves. So he is jealous for his people's love. We use the term totally different today, but the Bible term is God deserves our love. Therefore, God is a jealous God if we give our love to the high places or we give our love to someone else. We go a-whoring from him. We cheat on him. And he is jealous for our love because he deserves our love. He's our redeemer. He deserves our love. I am jealous for my wife's love. And I love the fact in 23 years, I've never questioned her love for some other guy. I'm jealous of that love. And if it ever comes up, I will be jealous for that love. Why? Because that love should be only given to me. That's the covenant we made for one another. And so I should not be jealous of another woman's love to another man. That love doesn't need to be directed at me. But God looks at us and says, love me. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Therefore, he's a jealous God. It's not a sin to be biblically jealous. He's jealous for us. What is a sin is envy. I have a wife, but I'm envying my neighbors. I'm coveting, coveting my neighbor's wife. That is a sin. And God says, my people have moved me to jealousy. They've moved me to want the love. I've done so much for them. I daily load them with benefits, and yet they go a-whoring. They're cheating on me. I'm jealous. They've moved me, verse 20, uh, 58, and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. Can you imagine leaving Exodus, or during the Exodus, leaving Egypt, getting to the promised land, and worshiping a dumb idol? And God on his throne is going, Really? You've moved me to jealousy. That worship belongs to me and me alone. Verse 59. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. Greatly abhorred Israel. This morning, the word was, oh, it starts with a D. You guys remember family devotions? Despise, despise. despise. And with the birthright, the two brothers had the birthright. And he says, you sell me your birthright. I'll give you this, this pour, uh, 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 soup, porridge. And uh, he said, yeah, what good is my birthright to me? If I don't eat, I'm going to die. So he goes ahead, gives him verbally his birthright. And the Bible says he ate and then he despised his birthright. The word despise means abhor. And here we have in verse number 59, when God heard this, he was wroth and greatly despised, abhorred Israel, his people. Don't let the world trick you into believing that God is not the God of the Bible. The world has this false picture of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit. God is a thrice holy God who hates your sin and my sin and the sins of the world. Period. That's not up for debate. He hates your sin. He loves his people and abhorred them at this point because of their sin. 
and their rejection of him. So verse 60, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. Can you imagine showing up to Saul Rock Baptist Tabernacle and trying to worship God and God's not even in it? He forsook, look, look at your Bible, verse 60. So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed the moment he built it. And he says, you know what, I'm leaving. I'm obviously not welcome with my own people. Verse 61, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He sold them into slavery again. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young man and their maidens were not given to marriage. Makes me think about our King James seminar with Brother Scheibach. The fire consumed their young man and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priest fell by the sword. What is a priest dying by the sword for? He's not even supposed to be in battle. How bad of a day is it where the priests are being killed with the sword? And God allowed this to happen. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. What? So I die and Sherry's like, well, oh well. I mean, how bad off are you if your past feelings... You could just have an abortion, throw the baby in the trash, and go back into the prom. That's where we're at now. We're past feelings. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord, and by the way, since I said that, kids, that literally happens. Like high school girls are pregnant. They go to the prom. They go into labor at a dance. They step outside or go to the bathroom, have the baby, and throw the baby in the trash and go back to the prom. That, that's not a made-up story. And that's not a one-time story. Say, so how could they do that? They have no fear of God. They have no actual fear or concept of God. That's why we've got to get them while they're young. Go back to the beginning of the chapter. That's why he said we've got to teach our children. We have to. Their priests fell by the sword, verse 64, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awakened as one out of sleep. Was the Lord asleep? Nope. He awakened as one out of sleep. At this point, judgment, 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 judgment. Then the Lord awakened as one out of sleep. And like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. That's a crazy picture. Like just a drunk guy, just rah! I mean, he's, he's up. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. If we weren't recording, oh, what I would say right now. I'm just going to stick to the text. Wow. Mm, don't say it. Keep going. What verse are we on? Don't say the one we just read. <laughs> <laughs> then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine and he smote his enemies in their hinder parts and he put them to a perpetual repro reproach moreover he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. There's always a remnant. Praise the Lord for that. And he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth which he hath established forever. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes, Great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of their heart. Is that what your King James Bible says? No, because their heart was trash. It was hot garbage. 
It was dog water. It was just disgusting. It was filthy rags. They were completely deserving of death. And what does God say in verse 72? So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of their hand. Is that what your King James Bible says? No, of his hand. You know what he did? He forgave them. Did they deserve it? No. Do you? No. Did they even ask for it? No. Oh, they did some, some uh, what was the word we used? Some rambling? They, they ran their mouth. They said some stuff. But God said their heart wasn't even in it. They didn't deserve it. So God wiped them out. And he said, you know, I can't use you tribes over here. But I've got this tribe over here. I'm going to move over that way and I'm going to build my sanctuary there. I'm going to use one man in particular. His name's David. I'm going to use him in a mighty way. And you know who Asaph was? David's song leader. When he got to the point of this Holy Spirit writing, he probably was excited that I get to serve this David. That's pretty awesome. And so it's vitally important for us to understand what weighs in the balance here. These children don't know God. Their fathers don't know God, but we do. And it's our responsibility to extend the forgiveness of God to them through here. And we're going to have fun. And we're going to do different things, but we're going to push, compel them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so lastly, your last blank. Again, verse 72. He fed them according to the integrity of his heart. And guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. What a God. Conclusion. God is so good. He's so good. And if you don't see yourself in this text, we shouldn't be friends. Because I don't want to make friends with a fool. You, you don't see yourself throughout this text. I'm not saying what part of the text are 72 verses. You might be David in this text. Praise the Lord for that. But I know for me, I'm looking at some of these early verses going, God, I'm drinking from the saucer while shaking my fists at you. God has done so much for me. I can't imagine if I were completely sold out for him. What is he being limited? How is he being limited? Because of me. And he's, he's, man, he's blessing. But how much more would he bless? Is he looking at me going, you know what? I'm going to have to move from you. And I'm going to go over here to Judah. I'm going to go over here. These people still worship me in spirit and in truth. In their heart. Church, I want to encourage you. He's the greatest forgiver ever. So receive his forgiveness. Get clean. And realize he's your redeemer. Don't shake your fists at him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. I know it's a Thursday night. Let's just have a time of invitation. We don't need the piano. The altar is always open. But every single one of us has to understand. Almighty God wants to use you. I, I don't know, a year ago, 12 months ago what God has done in 12 months in my personal life, my prayer life is through the roof right now. All because I made a commitment not to eat lunch until I've prayed an hour. And now I'm praying all day. I'm eating lunch happy, sometimes breakfast if I get up early enough to pray. But I'm praying all day. I'm praying all day now. Thinking about all of it. It's not a day that goes by I don't pray by name for my children, for their situations. I don't know what 12 months is going to bring now. I don't know what the next 12 months is going to look like. But I already like it. By faith, I already like it. 
if you're not doing something because of your sin, realize it's not about you. Verse 72 is for you. (laughs) It's the integrity of His heart. 